This week on The Communicators, an update on the Federal Communications Commission's efforts on a national broadband plan, plus other issues. Our guest is FCC Commissioner Robert McDowell. FCC Commissioner Robert McDowell is the senior Republican on the Federal Communications Commission, and he is our guest this week on The Communicators. Commissioner McDowell, we're about a month away from a national broadband plan being delivered. 43 from, days. 43 days yes. at this taping, uh, being delivered from the FCC. Can you give us an update on what is in that plan, what you've seen, and how it's developing? What we uh, had since uh, the middle of last year, uh, a team uh, that some uh, are, uh, have been brought in from the outside, uh, others are internal. Uh, the commission has done a terrific job of having numerous hearings and workshops and uh, issuing public notices to, to uh, solicit opinion and facts and analyses of, on just about every possible angle you can think of regarding how broadband might affect America and what can we do as a country uh, to make broadband more ubiquitous uh, and more available for folks all throughout the country. So fatter and faster pipes for more Americans. Um, our broadband team has given us a number of briefings uh, over the past few months, um, and uh, it's really going to boil down to, I think, a matter of supply and demand, uh, as simple as that. So what can we do to make sure there's adequate supply of fatter and faster pipes? What can we do uh, to make uh, the existing pipes uh, that serve those broadband connections, I call them pipes, uh, the, what can we do to make them fatter and faster for Americans? What can we do to make it more affordable? Uh, and what can we do to help um, Americans uh, want to subscribe more to, to broadband? Um, and that really involves just a plethora of, of issues. So we haven't yet seen a, the draft detailed plan. We've only seen outlines from our broadband plan team. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing more uh, in advance of what will probably be a vote uh, or a meeting at least where it's presented on uh, February the 11th. And what happens then on February the 11th or February the 17th uh, when it gets delivered? Does Congress have to approve it? It was part of the Stimulus Act from last year. Right. So actually uh, it's a little unclear. The, as part of the Stimulus Act, um, by the way, Congress wants us to look at all these issues from national defense to the environment to all these other national purposes, education, literacy, things of that nature, health care. Um, so uh, we will have it formally presented to us February the 11th. Uh, it is due to Congress February 17th. Uh, it is not self-executing. This plan is not anything that's a rule. Uh, there's really nothing legal. There's no legal effect of this plan. It's something that's presented to Congress, ideas and discussions that are presented to Congress. Uh, and then I imagine the commission will have a number of spin-off, what I'll call spin-off proceedings, uh, things such as reforming our universal service subsidy program uh, to see if that can support broadband. Uh, and things of that nature. Um, so uh, Congress may want to uh, address other issues. I hope we look at things, uh, or that Congress will uh, uh, look at things that we might suggest uh, from the Commission, such as tax incentives um, to help spur things uh, such as adoption. Uh, telecommuting, for instance, has m many benefits uh, that affect productivity in, in a positive way, the environment in a positive way, et cetera, but that could also help spur broadband adoption. Uh, so. Uh, in any case, there will be a lot, a lot of uh, ideas, I think, that this uh, plan will spawn, uh, and uh, we'll see as to how detailed it actually is. Cecilia Kong of the Washington Post, technology reporter, is also joining us today on The Communicators. Thanks so much. Commissioner McDowell, a little bit uh, more on the nuts and bolts. Does that mean, actually, that the Commission has to vote on the National Broadband Plan before it's presented to Congress? Does it have to be actually approved? by the five commissioners? Excellent question. I'm, you did use the word vote earlier, and I'm not sure there will be a vote. I don't know that uh, yet. So the statute really says the commission shall present to Congress this plan. Uh, that could mean a, a number of things. It could be uh, just the, the broadband plan team presenting it to the commission, and then it's delivered to the Hill. Um, so there are a number of ways historically that the commission has delivered reports and, and, and other documents uh, of significance to Congress. Uh, and unless it specifically says the commission shall vote, you know, all five commissioners shall vote, then I think it allows us to not do it that way. So the longer we don't have um, more specificity, uh, there's an argument to be made that maybe it won't be a formal vote. Again, it's not anything that's, uh, that has a legal effect, um, so a vote probably really isn't required. Is there a, a chance that there could be a Republican dissent from the broadband plan that's uh, put together? I guess there's always a chance there could be a Democrat dissent as well. Uh, 
uh, on any vote. You know, we are five independent commissioners, and whatever uh, gets teed up for a vote, uh, it's uh, possible there could be uh, concurrences and dissents as well as votes to approve outright on any item. You know, so close actually to the presentation of this plan to Congress. Um, I find it sort of sort of interesting that there is this lack of clarity on the process, given that there has so much been so much attention by the commission um, and the chairman on making sure the process works well and that it's transparent and that it's clear. What are your thoughts on the process, um, just given what we talked about and the, the, the lack of clarity on what happens on February 11th, what happens on February 17th? Right. I think the commission has done a terrific job of being absorbent, uh, of soliciting a lot of opinion and, and facts and analyses from the outside world on this broadband plan. Uh, and at several monthly meetings uh, this past fall and in, in December as well, um, the broadband plan team was, was presenting to us and to the world, the open meeting, their ideas, their outlines of ideas. So I, I think we've seen a, a sense of an outline of what it might look like, but we haven't actually seen the, the details yet. Uh, so that will um, come to us, I guess, as part of the normal commission process. Uh, traditionally, internal rules say we should uh, get uh, these documents tw 21 days before we have to vote on them, and then there, there comes that question regarding whether, that not, whether or not there'll be a vote. But um, uh, so it, it'll go through that process. We don't know if there'll be a vote, and. Um, you know, I think the process would speak for itself at that point. Commissioner McDowell, uh, given the fact that broadband really is in many ways uh, ubiquitous throughout the U.S., there are areas that don't have it, and it's been around for a long time now, is there, is there a purpose in a broadband plan for 2010? I, I, you know, we'll have to, you know, you'd have to read the statute, the Stimulus Act, to see what the purpose uh, would be from, from Congress's perspective, and that, I think, uh, really speaks to the fact that uh, broadband can affect every aspect of, of life here in, in America or throughout the world. Um, but you're absolutely right. There is up to, depending on what study you want to read, 95 percent some sort of broadband penetration. Uh, people can argue as to whether or not those speeds are fast enough and the bandwidth is, is uh, big enough to accommodate uh, the, the latest cutting edge uh, applications, the software that uh, runs through those pipes. Um, Ninety-two percent of the country is penetrated by cable, uh, cable plant, for instance. Um, that can be upgraded to maybe 100 megs per second um, merely by adoption of a system called DOCSIS 3.0, essentially a software upgrade, but it's more than that. There's a lot of capex and technical uh, issues associated with that. Uh, so we could get uh, the country you know, wired up to 100 megs or 92% or of the country anyway uh, just through that. But we want to see more competition. I think the um, since I've come to the commission, I've really started to or, or tried to focus on uh, the construction of new delivery platforms, uh, be it fiber, coax, uh, or wireless, uh, and other technologies as well. Um, and I think where there's the most promise right now is in wireless. Wireless broadband is the fastest growing segment of the broadband market. Uh, it's what consumers are saying they want, uh, therefore. Um, they also want uh, the reliability of fiber, though, or, or of other wireline technologies, coax, et cetera, uh, because of the, the speeds and the reliability there as well. So. Uh, to fill in that gap of that last 8 or 5 percent or whatever the number is uh, will be difficult. Earlier in uh, 2009, I went to Barrow, Alaska in the, in the winter, early March, uh, where it's 55 below. We're recording this on a very cold day in Washington. We're complaining when it's 20 some odd <laughs> degrees outside, but it was 55 below there. And they have a lot of challenges when it comes to broadband. Really, satellite is their only option. Due to the harsh weather conditions, it's very difficult to have even undersea cable make a landing there. Um, it's a coastal town right on the uh, beautiful, overlooks a beautiful Arctic Ocean. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so satellite for some fills in that gap. I want to make sure we don't forget about satellite because there are parts of America that just get nothing else but that. And it has limitations, satellite technology does, but we need to look at what we can do to make that um, uh, better uh, for consumers who are, have that as their only option as well. Your comments actually echo some of the some comments made by the White House and the Obama administration yesterday um, in comments filed to the FCC through the Department of Justice as well as from the NTIA um, in a letter where the administration basically said that there is um, more need for competition. And you're talking a little bit of a competition. I would love to, you, to hear you talk a little bit more about what you see as the competitive landscape today if there's not enough and your thoughts on Wireless, you mentioned wireless, um, that's something that was very much stressed by the administration yesterday. And how the commission should consider the fact that the biggest wireless players are also the biggest 
um, distributor of fixed wire um, internet access, AT and T and Verizon. Well, uh, you can can't have enough competition. At some point, markets might become saturated with competition, but I don't think that's the case here with broadband. So uh, really a fundamental priority of mine since coming to the commission in June of 06 has been to look for ways to create the opportunities for new competition. Uh, and that obviates the need. If you have a robust competitive marketplace, that obviates the need for regulation you know, on so many different levels. Uh, because uh, if you have one player acting in an anti-competitive way or in a, some sort of inefficient way, from a consumer's perspective, uh, then presumably consumers would have uh, more choices. So uh, I would like to see us, uh, certainly there's been discussion of spectrum audits, uh, that it could be a great idea as long as we understand uh, and manage our expectations ahead of time. Um, so for instance, it's very difficult to pinpoint a point on the map at a point in time and determine exactly who is using that spectrum uh, and for what purpose. Um, so we have to manage those expectations if a spectrum audit is conducted, and there's a lot of talk of this in action on Capitol Hill about this. Uh, the end product might not uh, give us full enlightenment and turn on all sorts of light bulbs in our head. Uh, it's going to uh, raise as many questions probably as it answers. But government uses about a third uh, of all available spectrum, and spectrum is finite. Uh, when we talk about spectrum, for the folks at home, we're talking about the airwaves, the, the radio waves, and different pieces of the spectrum, different frequencies are better for different uh, purposes. Uh, some frequencies, uh, the signals there can travel long distances and penetrate buildings like the television spectrum. Uh, others uh, travel short distances and are better for medical devices, um, things of that nature. So uh, it's a complex, you know, very complicated area, uh, but I do think uh, we are on the, f the early edge of what I'll call the golden age of wireless. I'm very, very optimistic um, about wireless's future. Uh, I was recently speaking to the inventor of the cell phone, who is, we all know who the inventor of the wireline phone is, Alexander Graham Bell. Do we know the, the name? We should all know this fellow's Don't name. Don't shame He's, me, Ozzy. No, no, I'm not going to shame you. <laughs> His name is Marty Cooper. Most 99.99% uh, of America has never heard of him. He's huh. the most influential person uh, nobody's ever heard of. Hmm. Um, and he's in his 80s now, and uh, you should have him on this program at some point. Hmm. Um, but his, uh, he has a theory, and I'll give him a lot of deference because he invented the cell phone. His, his theory, uh, Cooper's Law, as it's known, is that our spectral efficiency doubles every two and a half years. That means how much information can we squeeze over the same bit of the airwaves? Uh, that doubles every two and a half years. So since the radio was first invented, we are over two trillion times more spectrally efficient um, uh, today than, uh, than when the radio was first invented. So uh, I think it's important to understand that that trend should continue, at least for our lifetimes. Um, so when we talk about or hear about spectrum shortages, yes, we need to do what we can to get more spectrum out to the marketplace. But that can be measured in years before that can happen, before uh, the commission can find that, uh, or the co or Congress can help us with this too. Uh, to get that spectrum cleared, get it to auction, and actually get it built out. And you're talking maybe better part of a decade before that happens. So what do we do in the meantime as smartphones, such as the iPhone, as people like to point out, are consuming more and more of the airwaves to, to convey these wonderful new technologies to, to consumers? To consumers? Um, well, this, this sort of tension actually helps create an incentive to use the airwaves more efficiently. And if you continue to think of the, of the spectrum as, as real estate, and you think of the best spectrum maybe as, let's say, Manhattan, is it efficient to build a one-story gas station in downtown Manhattan, or a 30-story apartment building, or a 100-story office building? So just the way we want to have incentives for uh, the, the, the use of land, we want to have incentives for the, for the use of the spectrum as well. So that might be an unintended maybe benefit uh, to having a bit of a spectrum shortage while we work on this as quickly as we possibly can to get more spectrum out into the marketplace. Well, so there can be an upside. One issue with the spectrum is uh, what they call white spaces. And Google just recently applied to be an administrator of white spaces. Mm -hmm. If you could briefly tell us what these white spaces on the spectrum are and what Google's role potentially could be. Sure, so the television white spaces, I'm delighted you brought that up. Um, because I've been a proponent of, of, of use in this area. So the television white spaces are those unused TV channels in a market um, and in sort of gaps in, in, in the spectrum. Um, and in urban and suburban areas, the, the sort of uh, contour map, the, the configuration that it would look like on the map might be sort of salamander shaped. So these aren't nice and neat and clean 
uh, areas. Uh, so th you need to, they, they are more uh, amenable to unlicensed use than licensed use because of that. So back in November of 2008, the commission took both sort of a baby step and a giant leap all at the same time to sort of approve of use, unlicensed use of this part of the spectrum. So uh, some call it Wi-Fi on steroids. Others who are more technical have issues with that. But uh, for the folks watching right now, I think that's a good analogy. It's just to say it's, it's, it's Wi-Fi on steroids. It is wireless broadband uh, signals that can travel a long distance and penetrate buildings and carry a lot of information with them. So there was a lot of activity and, and, and noise and, and discussion leading up to our vote there in November of 08. And the commission did a very good job, I think, of trying to test new technologies to make sure this was viable and that it would not harmfully interfere with television broadcasters. Um, and so the paradigm, the basic prototype, worked. Since then, though, um, we have seen less activity, at least less discussion on the outside of the, of the, of the use of white spaces. And I think um, white spaces use really solves a lot of public policy issues. We'll probably talk about in a minute net neutrality and some others. Um, but this is a, a terrific way to get new powerful devices into the hands of consumers. Um, the, the role I think you're talking about for, for Google, and Google's just one of, of many parties probably interested in this, um, is there would have to be a nationwide database of where you are on the map. Where are there licensed users of those same frequencies on the map? So each handheld device, to get a little bit technical here, would be able to tell you where that consumer is on the map and if there's a licensee using that frequency for that given spot. If so, then that device has to switch to a different channel, a different frequency. Um, as well as the device would have to be able to detect if there's some other use of that frequency, licensed or unlicensed or not, so that uh, these devices don't cancel each other out and sort of shout each other uh, out and, and not be able to work as a result. So it gets very technical, but you need to have administrators of this. And, and the idea was set up to have uh, a neutral third party administrator for some of these. Um, aspects of it, and that I think is what you're talking about with with Google or other applicants as well. Do you think that that a neutral third party can be a commercial player that has business interests in communications? Uh, excellent, excellent point, and that's something that needs to be examined further. So um, historically, for things such as the administration of phone numbers, um, if you want to use that as an analogy here in FCC land, uh, that has been administered by a neutral third party that does not have other communications interests. Um, so that's an excellent point uh, and something that needs to be examined before any sort of uh, authority is granted. This is C-SPAN's Communicators Program. Our guest is Robert McDowell, the Senior Republican Commissioner on the FCC. Cecilia Kong is a technology reporter with the Washington Post. Cecilia, next topic. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about net neutrality. You, you mentioned I that in the funny. context of white spaces. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how white spaces, as you said, could solve some policy issues um, with net neutrality. But um, you have said that there has, you've agreed to, for the proceeding of, of a rulemaking um, uh, process, but you've also said that you don't think that there is necessarily a need for new policy. Is there a net neutrality policy or final rule that you could be comfortable with, and what would that look like? Well, first, we are about to uh, have our initial round of comments due at the FCC on January 14th, so we're taping this on the 5th, so I guess next week. Uh, and uh, the first thing I think we need to do is examine whether or not there is systemic market failure. The government uh, in 2007 twice looked at this issue to examine the market, the broadband market. Um, and this was the Federal Trade Commission as well, as well as the Federal Communications Commission. The Federal Trade Commission actually took this to a vote. It was a five to zero unanimous bipartisan vote that very strongly said there was no indication of systemic market failure that would necessitate um, net neutrality rules. Um, net neutrality has been, up until uh, this proceeding at the FCC, uh, sort of what I call a Rorschach term. It was undefined. But now we do have proposed rules that at least gives us a, a debate, a framework for a debate, which I think is a good thing. So the first thing we need to, to address, uh, I, I would like for, for potential commenters who might be uh, watching right now, is to please give us hard evidence uh, of systemic market failure. That, in other words, the concern is for the, for the proponents of net neutrality regulation is that network owners and operators, phone companies, cable companies, wireless companies, uh, might uh, somehow uh, discriminate against content or applications in an anti-competitive way um, 
to favor their own uh, business interests. Um, thus far, there has not been proof of systemic market failure. There have been three or four, five maybe, examples of some sort of nefarious behavior, but they've all been isolated. And once spotlighted, they, they were corrected, either settled before any government action or through consent decrees at the FCC. So I think that's important to note as well. So what is the ultimate cure for any potential anti-competitive conduct in any context, in any industry? That's more competition. So when the average American consumer has a choice of five wireless carriers, when uh, there's a cable company, uh, maybe a cable overbuilder in that market, uh, or and a phone company as well, um, I think that's important to note that then you might have eight, eight uh, last mile providers. We have more technologies coming over the horizon. Our 700, what we called our 700 megahertz auction that came uh, about as a result of the transition to digital television that freed up a lot of the TV spectrum. We auctioned that off uh, a couple years ago now, and uh, we are uh, not even seeing the fruits of, of the new uh, entrants that will come into certain markets um, for that. There's WiMAX technology, companies like Clearwire, another wireless broadband provider. Um, there's uh, still the fruits of our advanced wireless services auction from 2006 we haven't seen the fruits of, um, and, and many, many more. And then white spaces, which we've talked about before. That all can be helpful because, as I said before, if there is a last mile internet, uh, you know, that internet on-ramp, that last mile to the consumer, if there's a, a licensee or, or a market player that's acting in an anti-competitive way to somehow uh, frustrate cons the consumer's will by, by discriminating against uh, the content or applications that consumer wants to see or use, then if you have enough competition in the marketplace, the consumer can fire that, that uh, last mile provider and hire a new one. And I think that's the ultimate um, way to go. I'm always concerned about the potential uh, unforeseen consequences, unintended consequences of new regulations. New regulations or regulations of any kind act as a, as a tax. And when you tax or regulate something, you tend to get less of it. You tend to diminish it. Uh, it ten you tend to make it harder to produce that thing or that service that you're taxing. And you know, President Reagan, I might have said this on a, one of these earlier shows a couple years ago, but President Reagan used to have a, a, a saying that there are those who, if they see something moving, they want to tax it. If it keeps moving, they regulate it. And if it stops moving, they subsidize it. Yeah. And I want to make sure we don't do that with the Internet. A related issue to net neutrality, the, the term search neutrality is now becoming a, a pretty well known. Adam Raff, uh, co-founder of Foundum, recently wrote an op-ed in the New York Times about search neutrality. Will that be part of any net neutrality plan, or has that been raised at the FCC? The proposed rules, I guess, speak for themselves, uh, and uh, they place all the regulations on the network operators and not on the application providers. Uh, so I would just ask folks to look at those proposed rules and decide for themselves, but I think the, uh, the notice of proposed rulemaking that we voted on in October uh, actually discusses this a little bit, so I would welcome comment from uh, the public uh, as to whether or not there should be search neutrality, but also does the FCC even have jurisdiction or authority uh, to impose any of these rules to begin with, uh, let alone search neutrality. And do you think the FCC does have jurisdiction? I, I question that. It's a question I'm asking folks to, to help me out with. Um, in the context of uh, uh, an item from 2008 called the Comcast BitTorrent uh, uh, ruling that is being uh, litigated actually on January the 8th will be oral arguments at the D.C. Circuit, I dissented in that because uh, I, I question whether or not the uh, whether or not Congress has given the FCC the proper authority to exercise what's essentially old-style phone or common carrier regulation on information services that historically have been lightly regulated or deregulated all, altogether. Um, if, if Congress wanted us uh, to regulate these services, it would say so explicitly in the statute. Um, so. That's a question I want folks to help me out with, but I do question uh, whether or not we do have the authority to do that. Do you think, along the lines of um, competition being one solution for, for net neutrality um, or the idea of openness on the Internet, um, how does the Comcast, Comcast merger with NBC Universal and consolidation that you might see in the media space um, through that merger play into net neutrality and competition and just broadly in the communications media landscape? Well, first of all, all my lawyers tell me that I should not comment specifically on the Comcast uh, NBC or Universal. Just it's I, another company. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and that frustrates reporters when I say that. But uh, happy to talk about uh, the market in general. Uh, and by the way, uh, we haven't received the Comcast uh, application yet at the FCC. Hopefully, later in January we will. But um, so, uh, you know, what's interesting is uh, 
that transaction actually sort of bucks the trend of the past few years. In the past few years, really since I've been on the FCC, we've seen uh, a move more towards media deconsolidation, uh, divestiture. Uh, we've seen large media companies such as Clear Channel or Disney or CBS uh, and others actually selling off traditional media assets. And even what was interesting just last year, we saw Time Warner and Time Warner Cable break apart, sort of get a divorce, if you will, and now Comcast and NBC Universal are getting married. So uh, it would be a lot of fun to get Jeff Bucus, the CEO of uh, Time Warner, in the same room with Brian Roberts, the CEO of, of Comcast, to kind of debate what their two strategies are. Um, so this transaction sort of bucks that trend uh, in, in recent years. Um, and I think actually consumers, to answer your question more directly, are awash in more media choices now than ever before in the history of, of hu humanity. Uh, and I think that's a good thing uh, if we manage that properly. What do you think um, along those lines with, with video and entertainment that, and media that consumers are getting, they may be awash in more options, um, but there's a big transition taking place from fixed cable and fixed satellite um, uh, uh, delivery of, of video entertainment to the internet. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on competition in the video space. There was a, there was a, um, a complaint filed by um, some public interest groups to the Justice Department and the Federal Trade Commission saying that they're afraid that a strategy called TV Everywhere by the cable, satellite, and telecom, telecom industry could be anti-competitive. And um, in your jurisdiction at the FCC, looking at video competition and consumers' benefits for the public interest, what are your thoughts on the transition and any potential cracks in the foundation of competition going forward as more media goes onto the internet? Uh, excellent series of questions yes. there, <laughs> so uh, that we could keep us going all day with those. Um, it's a fascinating, exciting area to watch. And uh, yeah, Comscore, which is a ratings agency for online uh, activity, um, I think uh, their November figures for uh, October show that Americans downloaded 28 billion online videos in the month of October alone. And there were 167 Americans uh, doing that. Uh, and those numbers have been growing at double digit percentage uh, rates for quite some time. So I think what we see is a vibrant video market right now. Um, and uh, you know, this is more than just the, the Mentos and the Pepsi bottle that we saw in the early days of YouTube. These are full length movies and, and TV shows and uh, as well as user-generated content of all, all stripes that we couldn't even imagine uh, just uh, maybe five years ago. So I think it's a very competitive marketplace. It's very chaotic. Um, I try to get out into uh, the real world outside of Washington, D.C. as much as possible to, to speak with entrepreneurs and, and people who are um, trying to figure out how do you pay for all this. It's, um, consumers still want quality, scripted programming. And that costs a lot of money to produce. Uh, and the, there are two ways to, to fund that, advertising and subscriptions. And thus far, the market hasn't figured out another way to, to, to fund that. Um, so if, if consumers continue to want that, it's going to be interesting to see how the market evolves. Nobody really knows how the story is going to end up. We're sort of in the adolescence of, of uh, video competition and, and internet, uh, uh, the online world, in terms of what, what kind of services and, and, and content will be available there. So in, the, in adolescence, it can be an awkward, quirky time. You're not sure if it's gonna, uh, that, that uh, person's going to grow up to be a beautiful swan or an ugly duckling or whatever the case might be. And I think uh, a lot of folks in this space are trying to figure that out. And what we should do from a government policy perspective is allow as much freedom as possible for them to experiment and uh, make sure that there is no anti-competitive uh, conduct, certainly. I haven't read that particular uh, pleading that you talked about. It was filed at different agencies, not the FCC. Um, but right now, I think the, by every market indicator, the video marketplace is robustly competitive on, on so many different levels. We're almost out of time. Commissioner McDowell, uh, Senators Snow and Warner recently introduced legislation to bring more expertise to the FCC. Do you support that? I, how could I be against bringing more expertise to the FCC, especially when my home state senator, uh, Mark Warner, is introducing the bill? But uh, uh, I, I think that's a, a terrific thing, uh, and we do need to make sure we have more technical expertise at the FCC. We have a bit of a brain drain. A lot of our engineers, and we have some wonderful engineers on staff, um, 
uh, some of the best and brightest in the world, but some of them are reaching retirement age, and we need to be able to compete with the private sector to attract folks to uh, come to the commission. I, uh, if anyone's out there watching right now, I please please send in your resume to the FCC. We need you to uh, donate a few years of your life to public service. It's very, very important. And what is the role of Stuart Benjamin, and who is he? Stuart Benjamin, actually I've known Stuart Benjamin for a number of years. Um, uh, he went to, uh, he taught at my alma mater, Duke University, uh, and is on a leave of absence there, as our very first scholar in residence. Um, and uh, I will let him speak for himself as to his actual role, um, uh, but uh, he's there to, I think, to help us be a liaison between the commission and the academic community at a minimum. Uh, he's an expert on First Amendment law, so it's terrific to have, have him on board. He's a great guy. And we have a final question from Cecilia sure. Kong. You'll be at CES later this, this week. Um, that's a co consumer electronics show. What will you be looking at and what are your sort of, how will you be viewing um, what you see on the floor through a policy lens? Well, I, I like to go to the consumer electronics show because it gives me a very efficient one-stop shopping mm -hmm. for what's coming over the horizon for consumers here in the next year or two. Um, and I'll be looking to whatever they present to me. So there's always a surprise there. So uh, probably, uh, uh, you know, in a, w a week from now, we should be talking about what it was that I was most surprised about. But um, I think uh, what will be interesting to see is what sort of technologies are there to bring more uh, online uh, video content from the Internet to your TV set, not just your computer screen, but your TV screen. What can we do to make that easier for consumers? I know there are a lot of uh, companies out there trying to make that happen. So that'll be fascinating. And then also, uh, what are some of the new wireless uh, devices out there? Um, what, what's the latest uh, technology that, that folks are using? And what, how is the spectrum being used in ways we couldn't foresee even last year, last year's Consumer Electronics Show? So it's a very efficient way to learn a lot. As always, we appreciate your coming over to the communicators. Robert McDowell of the Federal Communications Commission, Cecilia Kong of the Washington Post. Thanks for having me. Thank you.